Hello and welcome back to Gen Chem with Dr. J. I'm Dr. Janita Pritchett and on this channel we cover all things Gen Chem related. On this video we'll be exploring heating curves of liquids and solids and learn how to actually do calculations associated with them. Let's get started. So if we were to plot um, how uh, the, the a graph associated with how what happens when we're heating up a liquid, we know that we are going to be adding heat over time. And so that's what's on the x-axis. So as we add that heat, we would expect that the temperature is going to start going up and up and up. And so if we plot what's going on with the liquid itself, well, the liquid itself is going to be raising up in temperature. And so you can see this, this um, linear region here where we see this increase associated with the temperature of the liquid. But then once we get to a point that is equivalent to its boiling point, well, there's a pause. And all the energy that's being added is now being utilized to convert those molecules from the liquid phase to the gas phase. So it's actually the vaporization process. And then once it's in that gas phase, it can then resume heating up that, that substance. And so we can actually calculate how much energy is associated with this overall process using a couple of small or quick calculations. When we're dealing with the heating curve portion, any of these linear sections, we're gonna be using this heat equals mass times specific heat times delta T equation. So we'd use that here as well as here on these any linear region. So these are the areas in which the, the heat that's added is strictly raising the temperature. And then when we're dealing with these boiling, these plateau regions where I'm physically going from like a liquid to a gas, that moment in time, well, now we're going to calculate the amount of heat based on the number of moles that are present times the delta H back or the heat of vaporization. Um, some things to remember um, when you're calculating the delta T, the change in temperature, you would only be including the change in temperature for that particular segment that you're on. So in this first segment, the temperature change would be 100 to 20. In the second segment, it would be from 140 to 100. So just make sure you pay attention to that. Also with the specific heat part, make sure you pay attention and pick the proper specific heat because for certain liquid or for certain substances, there's different specific heats for each of the different phases. So you just wanna make sure you pick the proper one, okay? Now, uh, there is a certain point in which we've added, we've, we've changed the pressure of the temperature uh, so uh, grand beyond this point, which we can create this substance, which is known as a supercritical fluid. So um, as a liquid is heated in a sealed container, more vapor is gonna collect and it's gonna cause this pressure to build up inside of the container. Um, and then after we get beyond a certain temperature, we're gonna end up having this uh, meniscus between the liquid barrier and the vapor barrier disappears. And we have this co-mingling that occurs of the two phases. And so substances that have this, this kind of um, intermediate properties between these gases and liquids, um, these are what we call supercritical fluids. And they have properties that are similar to both. and can be very beneficial when you're doing things like extractions, um, that require that, that duality. Now, what's gonna cause us to get a supercritical fluid is when we exceed what's called the critical point. The critical point is a temperature and pressure comp combination, um, particular to that substance, that once you go beyond it, you can't have that conden condensen condensation occurring and you'll remain in this supercritical fluid realm. All right, other processes that we have that occur. So we've talked about evaporation and condensation. We also know that there's sublimation and deposition. So sublimation occurs when we have uh, enough energy to take a solid directly to a gas phase. And so if you've ever seen dry ice, this is that phenomena. So dry ice, like which is um, um, solid carbon dioxide, at room temperature, it starts evaporating immediately, it, not evaporate, it starts to sublime immediately and you end up getting that vapor created. And being able to go directly from a gas to a solid is the process known as deposition. Again, for the sublimation process, we need a lot of energy coming in, it's endothermic. And for deposition, we need a lot of energy leaving, um, it's exothermic. All right, and this is just a picture representation for you. Um, and then the last process that we have, there are two processes to talk about is um, melting and, and, and um, melting and freezing. So melting in this chapter is gonna be referred to as fusion. And so when we're melting something, we're going from solid to liquid. And so again, we are gaining enough energy for those to come out of that locked orientation to get a few more degrees of freedom. 
The opposite process would be uh, crystallization or freezing. We can also create heating curves for solid material, very similar to the heating curve for a liquid, where we are pumping in energy to take something from the solid to the liquid phase. So again, we would track this by having uh, linear lines representing that portion where I'm heating up the material. And then there's this plateau position that represents our physical conversion from solid to liquid or the fusion process. And then we would be able to carry on. Just like before, when we're calculating the heat for these different segments, the heat of the first segment and the third segment, in this case, the linear portions are gonna be calculated based off of that heat equation. For the heat for that plateau, again, we would just take the mole amount that's present and times that by the delta H um, of fusion for that particular material. Um, so some basic energetics associated with melting. Um, we know melting is an endothermic process. I have to add energy in. Freezing is an exothermic process. We gotta remove energy out of there. Um, now, we can calculate that, that, that heat that's required um, through a very similar calculation that we did with the heat of vaporization a few videos ago. Just remember that the fusion process is endothermic. The freezing process, or what we say crystallization, would be exothermic. Um, and then if we wanted to um, uh, compare the heat of vaporization to the heat of fusion, it requires a ton more energy to get something from the liquid to the gas phase than it does from the solid to the liquid phase. And you've seen this, right? Think about like ice. If you put some ice on a countertop from the freezer, it's gonna start melting pretty immediately. But if I just leave liquid water on a countertop, it doesn't just start evaporating really quickly. I gotta pump in more energy, heat it up. And so if we compare the two, the heat of vaporization is much higher. Um, and then if we wanted to figure out what the heat of sublimation would be, we would add the two together. Heat of fusion, which is going from solid to liquid, heat of vaporization, which is going from liquid to gas to create our heat of sublimation, which is going from solid to gas immediately. All right, and you can see here this, this picture representation showing these differences that do occur um, between the heat of vaporization and the fusion. All right, so how would a problem like this be presented to us? So how a problem might be presented to us is that you're given um, some information about um, a particular substance. Um, notice we have some specific heat information, melting point, boiling point, heat of vaporization, all this stuff. And we're asked to determine how much heat in kilojoules is needed to raise the temperature of a 12 gram benzene sample from negative 10 degrees to 25 degrees Celsius. So what you would wanna do in order to attack this problem is you need to figure out how many segments are we dealing with in this heating process or cooling process, the same process, the same um, steps would be applied. In the heating process, what you would wanna do is come up with like a little heating curve. And I like to start by first plotting where my melting point is. So it doesn't have to be exact, but we'll say 5.5 is the melting point. And we'll say way up here, 80.1 is the boiling point. And then you go in and place where these transitions that are occurring in the problem are. So it's saying we're starting at negative 10 degrees. So that would be below my melting point and going to 25 degrees. So that would be above my melting point, but below my boiling point. And so then if I were to map this out, I would have a linear section going until I got to that melting point in which I know at the melting point, I'm now going to plateau for a quick second and convert from solid to liquid because we're, we're melting and then continue on to my 25 degrees. So this plot tells me I'm dealing with three separate segments, two linear ones. So segment one and segments three, I'm gonna use that heat formula. Heat equals the mass times specific heat times delta T, making sure that I'm picking the right specific heat. Notice we have all three and that I'm putting the proper change in temperatures. Not the change in temperature for the entire process, it's just for that particular segment, all right? And you wanna make sure here you, you have a clear idea that well, below the plateau, we're dealing with a solid material. Above the plateau, we have a liquid, okay? 
And then for segment two, where that plateau region is, well, to figure out the heat there, we would then be taking the mole amount of the substance times our heat of fusion. And we're selecting the heat of fusion, not the vaporization, because again, we're going from a solid to liquid. That is that melting process. And then after you have this map, it's a matter of doing the calculations. And so we would then map it out for each of the different segments, all right? And so segment one, we would end up by first calculating um, the heat for it. So we would take the mass times the specific heat of the solid times the change in temperature, which is only for that segment from negative 10 to 5.5. And we get a, a, a 0.23 uh, three kilojoules out. Now for segment two, well, now we're looking at the heat of fusion information. So we would first want to take our gram amount that we have, those 12 grams, and convert it to moles. Then we can go from moles to the kilojoules by simply multiplying by that conversion factor. Okay, so this is our heat of fusion. This conversion to moles just simply came from our molar mass. Okay. And then for segment three, we would now be dealing back again with that heat formula where we're now plugging in the specific heat for the liquid and the change in temperature for just that segment going from 5.5 to 25. And we get our, our, our kilojoules out accordingly. We would then ultimately add all three of those segments together to get our final overall heat that was input, which would be 2.1 kilojoules in this case. I hope this information helped you guys understand heating curves of liquids and solids. Make sure you guys like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know what other information you would like to see. Be sure to come back and check out some future videos or go back and look at some of my old videos if you need to catch up. I'll talk to you guys later. Have a great day. Bye-bye.